now anyway. Yeah, you guys should record this anyways, though. It's, mm -hmm. There's no decision making necessarily being made today, but it is good conversation to have about things that are going on in the community. So yeah. I'm going to um, hop off and have a good meeting, guys. All Bye, right. Jen. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Jen. Bye. All righty. So looks like it's us. Do I still read the pursuit chapter 20 since we're not a quorum? Does that happen? Yeah. No? Yeah. Yeah, I yeah you're, um, we're not taking any votes, right? We're, we're committing that we're not taking any votes while we're being recorded. We're not going to vote on anything. <laughs> yeah, right, right, yeah, right. We cannot. <laughs> uh -huh. And um, did you hear from the ever other members that they are unable to attend? Uh, I know Cedric, I've heard from earlier today. He he definitely can. He's uh he's running a practice. Okay. Then did Jen say that that Liz was having like technical difficulties? Is that what? I think that's what she said about Jen. Yeah. And then Juliana, she said, is not. Okay. All right. So yeah, I um, I think you should uh, read the chapter, but just state that because there's a lack of a quorum that you will not be uh, engaging in any yep. decision making. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You want to read it, Ben, or you have it up or no? Yeah. Yeah, I have it uh, here. Awesome. I was about to say, I'd have to look for it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. See instructions below. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. And... I will reiterate that we will not be voting on anything. We have no actionable items today. Sweet. Awesome. And it does look like we do have members from the public, so we can have public comment. And I just want to remind everybody that we cannot engage in any public comment. They are just, we're just here as spectators. So if any members from the public would wish, wish to speak, please raise your hand. We will bring you in. Hey, here. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, hi. My name is Vera Duong Mini Cage. I live at 12 Longmeadow Drive, apartment 21 in Amherst, and I go by she, her pronouns. I wanted to um, share uh, a, a Gazette news article um, that was published this week. Um, and headline is Amherst man, victim of possible hate crime near Yale University. I uh, was contacted uh, through Facebook Messenger by one of the um, friend's family um, about this incident. <clears throat> so uh, it involves, um, there's also a GoFundMe in the article. And I wanted to see if the Human Rights Commission can look into it um, <clears throat> and issue a statement of support or solidarity, or at least um, reach out to the family formally to, to offer our communities um, support while they um, go through the healing process and the stages of, um, you know, repairing their body. Um, because I, I guess there was some real major physical um, um, injuries um, to, to the victim. Um, and let's see. Um, so one of, part of the article, it says, um, um, since being discharged from a hospital about a week after the incident, Rosa has been recuperating at his mother's home. According to his sister Jocelyn, like his sister and mother, Rosa had worked at the Bueno Isano in Amherst. He graduated from Belchertown High School in 2015 and had been a member of its football team. At the Main Street restaurant near the main counter, his picture is on a poster along with a description of what happened and QR code allowing people to directly access the fundraiser. Um, and moving on to my other um, uh, topic that I wanted to 
uh, raised with the commission. Um, I did forward earlier um, today in late afternoon, um, some information about open meeting law, um, law uh, regulations um, and when uh, public bodies would be committing OML violations. And I think um, I had heard in the community circulating that you know, if, if a public comment, and even in your notice um, to the public announcing this meeting, um, I just wanna make sure that, you know, that not responding to public comments in real time um, is something that is, that's an internal decision um, and not something specific to any OML um, uh, citation um, because uh, that's, you know, OML, um, basically is not invite, there's no violation of, of open meeting law um, if there were to be discussions on topics raised in public comment that are not um, listed in the meeting agenda. Um, if the chair or co-chair um, did not anticipate it um, within you know 48 hours. So, um, so there's more to the email that I sent and I hope um, the committee reviews that and adjust your notices accordingly to um, follow along with the law. Um, and I'll leave my public comment at, at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. I do just wanna put on the record that Liz Figgett is now in the meeting and I believe that brings us to, does that bring us to a quorum? Four? Yeah, we're, we're technically supposed to have nine members, but we don't have nine members, so that would be the quorum. Yeah. Pamela, you're on mute. mute. Um, I, uh, I believe that you're still required to have five members because it's a nine member board. Okay. Um, so you're, you would need one other person to be at, at quorum. <clears throat> Got it, understood then. Still um, at public comment of this meeting, any other um, people from the public would like to speak? Please raise your hand. I don't see any other um, hands raised at this time. All right, then we will move on from public comment. We have HRC member reports. Let's see, I have for our um, Sunrise Amherst, our Sun, yes, yeah, Sunrise Amherst, they are putting together a Know Your Rights workshop that they have asked us to co sponsor with. Um, and they're looking to have that event on. October 3rd after our um, retreat, not during, and it would be via Zoom, but as soon as I have more information on that and a link, I will send it out and we will advertise on our Facebook and get it out to members. And like, as I said, it's a Know Your Rights workshop um, is what they're putting together. And then, for Latinx Heritage Month, we are putting together something um, Victor, myself, and Jen have been working on for October 15th at Kendrick Park. I believe the time is still being determined, but we are working on that because we do have the Amherst um, Farmer's Market happening at that time. And then I believe a cider run is happening at that time as well. But we are looking to hopefully do it around 12 o'clock. And we're looking to have uh, food vendors there, performers and music and um, Amherst College is um, co-sponsoring that event. So that will be good. Any questions there? Liz, you hopped off mute or do you have a question or no? I just wanna, huh? Can you yeah, hear me? Yep, we can October, hear you. 5th, October 15th is also the ABC Fall Foliage 
walk run. Okay. Do we know what time that is? No. Okay. I'll look into it. Thank you for bringing that to my that, attention. Uh, starts at like. I think you went on mute or something, Liz. I think she's frozen, at least on okay. my screen. Yeah, all right. Some technical difficulties. Seems like that is the theme of the night. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, well, Liz, if you hear us or get back on, just you can chime in or put it in the chat. Uh, that's all I have for member reports. Anybody else have anything for member reports? Yeah, I have a, another shameless plug, like I do every time, but the School Equity Advisory Committee, which I'm also a part of, is still looking for members. We can never have too many folks speaking out about equity in our schools. So, so I guess I and I guess I would be the point of I don't guess I would be the point of contact for that if anybody was interested. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? No. Nope. All right. Then that brings us to our first agenda item. We have the APD police police video. Um, I sent out an email as it was given to me earlier today um, in regards to the family's response and kind of um, giving a place to give their um, statement out to the public. And then there was also an attachment of quotes from how the victims of this incident, which would be the children, um, felt during that time, what they perceived was happening during that time, and just all kind of around that nature. Did uh, people have a moment to look at that? I know that came in earlier today. Ben, you there, or Liz, Victor? Yeah. I'm yeah. Here. Yep, I'm here. Any comments or? We lost Liz. Yeah, trying to untangle difficulties here too. I guess there you go. Yeah, so I didn't have a chance to read it. Are there any like specifics about their response? It's mainly a statement from the family put out. This is kind of our our um, only response that we have gotten from family and from. I'm sorry, Liz is trying to get it from the chat. And from the child, the um, children's response to how they felt during that time. And more so the reason why it's being brought up and put into our purview is because of our nature of being able to file a complaint as a human rights commission and the hope is to get this document into some type of recognition, either would that be from the town, that'd be from us, that'd be from the police report that I believe still has not gone out. So that way voices are heard on the other side of the incident. Yeah. Have we gotten any indication from APD as to like when we might see some sort of report? I have not, Pamela. But it, it seems like this seems like a long time. Like July fifth was well, like wow. two and a half months ago. Yeah. Right. So my understanding is that following the town council meeting, um, I'm not sure of the date. I think that was August fifteenth. I'm not again. I'm I'm yeah. I'm not sure. But the town council meeting uh, that the police 
were instructed to make contact with all of the families involved and that they uh, attempted to do so by phone. Um, uh, it's my knowledge, to my knowledge, they were, they only, they only had two families. I don't think there were more than two families that responded to their attempts for further information and contact. And then they were um, directed to finalize their internal investigation. So. Was, there, was there any other means besides directly talking to the police for the families? Like, was there any sort of like a mediator? There, there is not. So the we the town is really stymied because the only avenue for investigation of police misconduct currently is through the police department. So there's not another method by which families could, you know, file a complaint other than bringing it to the attention of, you know, the Human Rights Commission. So um, in the absence of like a civilian oversight board or some other type of avenue directly contacting the police is really it and only the police department has the authority to uh, investigate or you know pro make recommendations for discipline or any of those actions like the only authority to do that rests with them so yeah because I'm, I'm just thinking like as a parent if my issue was that the that, that a member of the APD had told my son that he lacks constitutional rights, I might be reluctant to talk to them. But I guess they did send us this statement, right? So is it possible to present that? Like, I know we're not in quorum, but can we get that on the public record? Is that a thing we could do? So I think that was um, that. So Philip this afternoon did send me the two uh, letters, but um, and asked if I could attach them to the agenda. It's my understanding that mm -hmm. in order for them to be part of the agenda, it needed to be, the agenda needs to be posted 48 hours in advance of the, of the meeting. But yeah, um, I did say that um, because that was already listed, the Amherst Police Department video was listed as a discussion item that they could be discussed. But I don't, I think it was, I think we would have, we needed to have um, posted them 48 hours in advance of the meeting, but they're, because the topic is already open for discussion, I think they're, it's okay for us to have the, or for you guys to have the conversation. Right, so I'm just thinking like, like at, at school committee, like if we have it on the agenda, as long as we have it in the packet before we get rolling, it, it's usually, usually works. Or I guess we could, I, I guess if we're going by the books, we could wait till number three, or six, I mean, sorry. I don't know why I just made up the number three. No, so I, I think it's appropriate for, for I mean, uh, the Amherst Police Department Facebook video is listed as the first um, action and discussion item. So I, I think that you're perfectly okay to have the conversation about the information because it was listed as a topic. Right. I, but my understanding is that in or, that the packet had to be posted, the agenda packet had to be posted 48 hours. I, th I believe that that was um, part of the of the first public comment. So um, as you all know, I am uh, fairly new to this role, so I may be incorrect uh, um, in my understanding, but um, I knew that it was certainly appropriate for discussion because it was listed as a discussion item. But my understanding was that the agenda had uh, and packets should have been posted 48 hours in advance of the, of the meeting. So then are we able to share screen and put this up or is that basically? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think you probably could um, share a screen and, and put it up, you know, because the, the meeting is being recorded and, um, and the topic has been listed and um, you would be in seeing at the same time as any members of the of the public who are, are who are attending. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, I, I feel like the I mean that's like the most recent addition that we have to the discussion. And it's tough to talk about it blind, you know what I mean? Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. This is going to be the statement by the families. Hopefully technology is on our side. 
Let's see if I can get it going. Is that sharing? Uh, yes. Awesome. Uh, ben, do you mind reading out loud here? Or I'll that... give it a try. I, th I think I can. Bear with me here. All right. So it has been a little over two months since two armed and uniformed Amherst police officers responded to a noise complaint at a working class apartment complex as many were settling in from Independence Day festivities. Police with their cruisers and flashing lights pulled into the apartment complex parking lot, found a group of young teens to assert their power and authority and deprive them wrongfully of their constitutional rights. The teens were instructed to sit on the pavement in a row like suspects in a police lineup. Of the nine youth involved, six are black and Latino. They are our sons. Try to put yourself in our son's shoes. They were simply waiting and congregating in a friend's parking lot to provide accompaniment and comfort in a distressing and unfortunate time when they heard a friend was stuck with a flat tire. This is what grownups call mutual aid. They weren't going anywhere until that friend's problems were resolved. Our sons were the wrong color at the wrong time. Some who have lived here longer than the ages of our boys will tell it like it is that our color has always been the wrong color for Amherst and based on our based on color have always and forever been a target and will forever be a target a target of unfair punishment interrogation detention and harassment our children have been traumatized not by brutal police force but by the blunt force of racism in the suffocation of racial profiling that they have witnessed and now have experienced themselves over and over again. We look forward to continuing solidarity work with the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee to achieve our goals while protecting our children, their identities and their future. A quote from the parents. It is just so unfortunate I chose to live here and raise children because I thought it would be different here because of diversity. Our children feel unsafe regarding what they have seen in the US with police and young people of color as well as adults. And they thought they were protected here. They took away the trust and belief of safety they and we are supposed to have while our kids are out there. Why didn't they make them feel safe as they waited for AAA? Parents teach kids to trust the police and call on them for help. They took that away. The chief of police is chalking it up to having a slice of pizza with our children to smooth out the harm. Let me run that back, sorry. The chief of police chalking it up to having a slice of pizza with our children to smooth out the harm is offensive and disrespectful. Nothing close to that is going to melt away feelings of unease and unrest in our hearts and minds from the damage done. Thank you, Ben, for reading that. I'm, I'm happy I was able to actually see eyes not being what they used to be. So I'll open it up to the group for any anything that anybody wants to say right now. Not to put anyone on the spot, I'm kind of interested in what what Victor's take on this is. I know we discussed it before, but I mean, you're closer to their age bracket and demographic. I know personally, <clears throat> I'm very um, not understanding of the situation, but I see where these kids are coming from. And then reading the quotes of the young people themselves, it kind of, puts myself in a shoe, what would I have done if I were in their situation? And in any other given circumstance, something like that could happen to me. Um, I know I've been in situations where I've been driving and I've seen the police officer behind me and I'm like, you know, uh, I don't know. I can't say that I'm, I feel protected. I feel like now, especially after this event, like there's a target on my back. Um, I feel like there's just, 
so much that us as young people are often neglected for when we speak up for ourselves, as well as I feel like the fight that we have to endure is different from which the adults understand. And in a way, we sort of have to navigate and kind of go through this on our own for like, at least in our school, everyone is very upset with the circumstances that has come from this. Um, people are still not happy with the way that the Amherst Police Department has dealt with this, especially when it's come to what an apology is, like taking them out to get food doesn't really correlate with <laughs> the actual words or actions that these kids and families really need. And it's gone to the point where we're not understanding. We just want something to actually get done in a way where it's this will not happen again, rather than I'm sorry this happened, but there's nothing we can do. And it's just f all frustration from over here. Did the chief of police actually, uh, I know that they said the chief of police took the kids for pizza, but uh, what about the two officers involved? Have they reached back or reached out to anybody? Uh, the pizza comment is from the August 15th um, town meeting. That was a suggestion from the chief of police to have an outreach kind of circle as for the kids. And as far as police engagement with the children, I do not believe that has happened yet. Pamela, do you know otherwise? Because it's really for the police to go and try to make amends, but it would be more powerful for the kids in, that were involved and for people like Victor and my sons and my grandsons and Miss Ononi Bacco's grandsons and everybody else's um, children, um, Darius, because I know that Vera's there, um, for the people that were involved to express their wrongs not to the newspaper, because apparently there was something in the newspaper, but why don't the people that were involved reach back and make some kind of amends or apology or, you know, whatever to the, the students and the families involved as opposed to the chief of police? Uh, so to my knowledge, I don't think that the chief or the officers have involved have spoken with anyone uh, directly. So I think the only direct contact um, from the police department has been from the officer who was investigating. Uh, and again, that's to my knowledge, I could be wrong, but I, I, don't, I don't think that any direct contact other than the uh, investigating officer has happened. No, thank you for that. I'm gonna uh, screen share the other document that was shared with me and sent out to this group, just so that way that can be put on record. This is um, quotes from the actual people, and I wanna say that again, the actual people, victims involved in this situation and how it is that they felt, how they interpreted that night that this incident happened. And I just want to maybe pull out a couple of them. There are a lot of them. And I am sorry that we may not be able to read through them all, but I do, like I am saying, I do want to put this on record. I do want this to be out there for the public, but am I safe to walk alone or with anyone really? Someone after that incident, am I safe enough to even walk down the street? To what degree am I, to be concerned with my own safety. Again, I'm only pulling out a couple. The police were yelling, power tripping. They were yelling, we were detained. Sorry if I can't see the rest of that. They were yelling, we had no rights. And so overall, when you go through this, when you read them all, and I do hope that every commissioner on this committee does have time to read them all. And I believe um, we will have access to 
share this out in some way, whether that be in uh, posting of the meeting and or on our own website, because I couldn't see why that's not a, or why that is an issue or anything. It is basically over and over again saying the interpretation of being told that you have no rights by someone of authority, police officer in this instance, created enough fear for these individuals to kind of just abide by whatever they're being told. And I am really sorry, I might get a little more emotional. I really tried to read this in, but this can be the defining moment in these young individuals' lives, right? There are a couple of older people of color on this committee. And I think we can all think back of to when that first incident of racism happened to us or that first incident where we can recall. And it saddens me so much that this has happened in our town. And I really think that to Victor's point, the response has been not a great response. And that these kids are going to have to live with this for the rest of their lives. They're going to be feared for the rest of their life in this incident. And just to think that you can't even walk down the street, you can't even drive your car with your friend, you can't even help someone in their time of need of getting a flat tire, because I think we all have been there in one way or another with the car of, hey, like, oh my gosh, like I need a ride home or I need something. You can't even rely to call 911 in that incident because of this moment. And I think that that's really what's hitting it home for me is that what it appears as of the town, what it appears as from the PD is that we don't care enough what these BIPOC individuals have gone through in a defining moment in their life. Yeah. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, for one, I, I think about like, so my son, I mean, the majority of his friends look like him and live in like, like we, this, I live in a similar neighborhood, right? Like, so to, to me, this kind of codifies, I, I, I try to let go of like, like how you talk about the trauma that's formed. Like, I recall having incidents when I first got my driver's license that I've not let go of. And it, it actually like, like, this validates the fact that I tell my kid that like, that's, you know, like Mr. Rogers said, in, in situations of, of chaos, you look for the helpers. I tell my kid that that's not who you look for, for the helpers, you know, and it, it's horrible that I have to say that even living here in Amherst, I moved up here from Hartford, Connecticut to avoid this type of situation, only to realize, and I'll be blunt, I did not realize as, as a result of July 5th, 2022, that that's what we were dealing with here. I mean, I, I, I think uh, Vera, Vera's on this, this call, she can vouch for the fact that like like even when I was running for office I was waiting for my campaign manager who also happens to be on this call and is also Vera but I got like ID checked by Amherst PD by like young revved up cops or whatever and like so I mean it's it our, our kids should be protected right like that's that's what their role was when they came there even in the report it said that the reason that those kids could not leave was because they were in the quote unquote care of the police at that point that's their job is to keep them safe that's exactly what should have been verbalized the second they talk to them, right? You guys aren't in trouble. We're here to help you. Any anything like that, right? Like, I mean, I, I work in the schools, and you absolutely do not put the punitive down right away. That you have no rights. Like, as far as I know, like our police department doesn't differ from every other police department in the nation, right? They they swear an oath to the uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States of America, right? Like, so how do you do that? How do you hold that oath? and then tell our little black and brown kids that they don't have rights under the constitution. They are the authority. They are who essentially represents the law, right? Like the, the law in like, a, a, like a, an active way in our lives, right? There's a lot of entities that represent the law, but they are the direct first line representation of the law and that constitution that they uphold. And that to me, that's the part that I'm like most incensed about that like, you're here to protect and serve. You didn't protect those kids. You didn't serve those kids. You threatened those kids. You know, you traumatize those kids. And so that's the, that's the part where I can't get over like the, 
I mean, even the, the, the notion that you would, the inference that you would sit down with these kids for pizza. If you're the boss of the people who treats my kid like that, there's no sitting down and breaking bread. You, you need to make this right. You know, you need to do things to make them whole. You want these same kids. At some point, you're going to want them to co cooperate with you, to acquiesce with you with your investigation at some point. I've seen this recently, like without talking about the day job, but they're not going to do that. You know, they don't trust you. You are a threat to them. You've proven that you were a threat to them. And your superiors upheld that. Even, even if passively, I'm not going to say, I won't say that the chief Livingstone is walking around saying that, these officers did a fine job and this is what we're training people to do. I also don't know that that never happened, right? Because there, there hasn't been any sort of public statement or you know, no finality. And again, I mean, this is a very long drawn out investigation. You know, I mean, and this is a long drawn out investigation for something that at least a segment of it was witnessed via video. You'd think that you'd wanna wrap that up sooner than later. And I mean, I don't know. I think the responsibility is still on them to make this matter right. And it still is not right. I just want to say that firmly that this still has not been made right. So that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm going to try to keep it at that because I think everything else I have to say after that is inflammatory. So. Thanks for that, Ben. Liz or Victor, do you have anything to add? Only that what Ben just um professed is some of the things that we talked about when we first had the very first meeting after the video um, surfaced. And um, so it's unfortunate that this is now the third meeting in which we're talking about the same thing with no resolve. I also wanna add that I think that the inability to apologize or at least just have some type of conversation with the victims involved has also impacted our community to believe that this will be a reoccurring thing or i know that unfortunately um many people have asked me already kind of what the police officers have done in a way to say that this is not who they are or this is not what the APD represents but everybody knows they have not done it in a manner for anyone to believe them or at least I know that many of the other BIPOC youth that are a part of my school feel all types of anger and fear towards the police officers in every way but also they themselves don't want to be victims of this type of crime and even though i don't know what the literal i don't like consequences of this could be but to many they just don't feel safe where many of us grew up realizing that amherst is not like any other city or town you know many of us grew up with our parents telling us that we live here because there really is no type of violence. There's not too much that many of us can get involved in, but it's scary to believe that the only thing we have to fear is being pulled over by a police officer, being told that we have no rights, and then being power tripped in a way where the only people that we're supposed to call in any emergency or in any time where we need help are the people that we have to actually ignore or be the last result to actually call. And it's just really, I, I'm trying to like calm down because there are many ways that I feel right now, but like, it's, it's just so, I don't even know. It's just, I've, I've, I've felt so much. I've talked to so many people and still no one is able to actually say, oh, I understand what they're doing or, oh, I understand why they're not saying anything. Cause no one does. No one can explain why the officers aren't contacting anybody. And I think that's one of the most vital parts that's missing from this investigation is the silence, which is just ultimately adding to this irreversible image that the police department will have if they don't have this type of reassurance to the victims and our youth as well. So I, I just want to be clear about one, one point, which is that I believe that the police department has concluded their investigation, as I said earlier. It's my 
uh, my belief that the uh, there was an attempt made to contact all of the family members and only two family members or two families responded in some way. Um, I don't, I, I, I think that they have definitely concluded their investigation. And uh, Victor, to answer in part your question about um, why things are not more apparent uh, it, it, in part, it's because of the way in which um, the discipline has to occur within a police department. So, you know, not to make this all about the law, but the police officers operate under a collective bargaining agreement, and that contract between the police officers and the town dictates um, how they will be disciplined and the manner that it will take place and what um, types of uh, information would be shared uh, publicly, if any. And in most cases of any employer, whether it's a town or private employer, most employee disciplinary actions are generally not made public. Um, that I think is one reason why there has been such a strong push in the town um, to have a civilian um, or resident oversight board of police matters because that would um, allow for more um, clarity, oversight, transparency about the actions that were taking place. But um, it, you know we, we are we don't we don't have that yet as uh, as a way in which to have, um, the conversation. And so I think it will be really important um, in throughout this year it, to make sure that the board, the resident oversight board is created in a way that meets the needs of the um, community members. And, um, and, and, you know, drafting and creating that board um, so that it has all of the power and that is deemed necessary to have these conversations. So you um, recently discussed, there was a, a case in Pittsfield of a man who was kill, um, killed by poli Pittsfield police. And the, there was an attempt by their civilian oversight board to have more investigation, more conversation about that particular incident. And unfortunately, the ways in which they had created the board did not, didn't allow them to. So I'm not trying to justify, but I just want to give you that as an explanation of, of, of about why things are happening in the way in which they um, are occurring. And I guess the hope would be that um, as the resident oversight board or civilian oversight board comes to pass, that the transparency that you seek would be created. Thank you for that, Pamela. Ben, are you saying something? You're on mute. I am. I'm currently saying it to myself, into the dog in the corner. But no, one of the one of the, the questions that I have with this in terms of you know not being able to contact all of the families involved and, and you know, like I said, if the police officer had wronged my son, I'd be a little bit reluctant to go ahead and chop it up with you have a great conversation or anything but like we also knew that crest was going to come online september 6th i mean did they not have the ability to wait for them to come online because we actually got a we got the right people in in those positions many or i'll say at least some of whom are very familiar with folks involved mm -hmm. right so and, and I, I feel like that they would be more trusting or maybe Maybe they're looking at this as a lesson going forward, but I'm not sure that that makes any of this feel better. You know what I mean? Right. Like, like, I, like I get it. Like I, 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 I supervise people that are under a CBA and like, I, you know, I have to go along with, with certain things, but like, I, I don't think I've ever heard that I can't allow anyone to like a, make amends or anything. You know what I mean? Like, right. So, I, I mean, I, so I obviously, I, I can't speak to, the actions yeah. of the individual officers. I don't. I don't know. Right. You know what their what they're thinking or what actions they want to take or, or not take. And there was some um, 
conversation, actually, I think from the CSSJC um, to, I think there was a, a call in one of the, or, or a call meaning a call for action to, to have the Crest responders have conversations with, um, with the youth that was involved. So it, I, I'm, I don't know why that did not occur. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know why. And I, um, although the investigation is complete, um, or, uh, I don't, I mean, it, there still would be the possibility maybe that, uh, that the crest responders might have conversations. Uh, although I don't know, I mean, the information that they obtained, I don't know whether that would then be have the ability to be a part of the, you know, investigation. Like it's not yeah. gonna, gonna, it's gonna, it's still gonna be external to the collective bargaining agreement at this time. So I'm not, I'm not really sure. Yeah. I can get that, and I understand that for the purposes of these statements and this draft by the family members involved. How can the Human Rights Commission, the DEI department, take that information in? And what can we do from this moment? Since it, and also, I have a question on the police report. Are we going to get that since we filed a complaint with them? You would think that they would want to at least full circle us into that conversation and can that be public? Is that gonna be public? What's going on with that? So I, um, in my role as the DEI director did receive a letter from one of the family members that I immediately uh, gave to the uh, Amherst Police Department. So they had that information as part of all of the information that that they obtained. And my understanding is that they did, although they only talked with two families, that they did attempt to talk with every family. Um, and some people were not interested for you know, whatever reasons in having conversations with them. So I'm not quite sure about, uh, um, about what the procedure would be. I, I was under the understanding that the police department was going to respond formally to your um, complaint, but I, I, you know, I don't. All I have a lot of a lot of missing pieces. I know that you haven't received anything, but I, I was I was under the understanding that you would um, would have were supposed to receive some sort of response. So I guess. I, at this point, since there, since that complaint is still out there from the HRC, and you have not received uh, a response, so that is still an open avenue. It is probably possible for you to submit this additional information uh, to the police department. At least it will be formally a part of the records that they have. But I do believe, as I said, they've you know, completed their formal inv investigation. I don't know if um, that report uh, would be made public. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, I just don't know the, the answer to that. So, um, I, I'm trying to figure out how to word this thing, right. But so, so even if it's not released publicly, wouldn't shouldn't we get some glimpse or glimmer of like what all that would in, that investigation entailed and like at least what their findings were so I, I again I I just don't I don't I'm I'm hesitant to speak because I just don't know the process I don't want to say something is the process and then be incorrect about it yeah. um so, and and to be quite honest uh in the short I don't I don't know if the HRC has ever submitted a complaint to another town department, regardless of what that department was, whether police or, or something else. The only uh, information about that I have about human um, rights commissions 
sort of complaints of inquiries have all been between private citizens in the town. And so um, one of the things that's up for discussion at the retreat is what should the procedure be for this body? Um, I've, uh, and what, um, what I've been told in the past has been the procedure is that generally a complaint has come in by an individual against another individual or a business and that the, um, in the past, the human resources director sort of served as the, um, you know, the adjudicatory board or the person who was going to hear both sides of that complaint and then try to, uh, to really mediate a, you know, some sort of resolution. Because, you know, one of the things that uh, Jennifer and I had conversations about when she was telling me how the HRC had worked in the past. Um, it's my uh, opinion. Um, and if you have, you know, two lawyers, you'll have like five opinions. But um, it's my opinion that what the board is legally able to do is very restricted. Um, and if you go and look at the bylaws that create the Human Rights Commission, it sort of states in the very last sentence that basically this body has the ability to refer cases to other state or federal agencies. Like, you know, we can serve as a mediator, but we don't um, in the bylaws or by state or federal law really have the, uh, have the authority to hear cases, come to a decision, investigate. Like that's, it's not something that the that the HRC has the authority to do. And I said, you know, again, this is in my opinion, other people may may feel differently. Um, but if you read the bylaws, um, they're, they're pretty clear about what's what the authority is for this body. We, we do have the the right or authority to bump it up to the state level if, mm -hmm. yes. if we do not get satisfaction here. Yes. So yeah. the the HRC would, and as I said, that this is based on my understanding of what's happened in the past, is that um, you know the body would hear complaints from individuals against other individuals or other or other uh, you know bodies or companies, and then they would have the authority to try to mediate a solution, um, and then um, if they were unsuccessful in in that mediation. Uh, you know, the natural place for most of the complaints that would come um, before this body would be the Mass Commission Against Discrimination. Um, and, but, you know, they could also go to an Attorney General's office or Consumer uh, Protection Office or to the EEOC, which is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. I mean, there are other bodies that would actually have the authority um, to... Um, so there are some very interesting, not to get off topic, sort of uh, sort of legal questions. Um, one of the other ones that was raised is that um, how do you have these uh, uh, conversations confidentially if you're a public body? And um, some of the examples of the other HRCs that I've provided uh, for the board to consider um, state very specifically that the role of the investigator or mediator for the Human Rights Com Commission um, is to mediate. And there are state laws in place that would um, state specifically or hold specifically that mediation conversations can be confidential. So they would be outside of the pub, you know, the open meeting law. And there was a hand raised if you uh, want to return for additional public comment. Yeah, I'm okay with doing that. But before we um, go to that hand raised, I just do want to say or want to put on record here that I do want something to come from this other than I send an email to the police department for them to put on record to go, oh, thanks, we're done with our investigation anyways, but like, thanks for trying type of thing. Because if the town has created this body and the town has created a way for a complaint to go through other than the police department, I do feel as if we do 
need to have some type of way to have a resolution that doesn't involve the police department, whether that be kind of this committee, now that the DEI department is created, someone to, in this particular instance, someone to basically look at it and be like, yeah, you know what, that officer's comments really taken for what it is by the individual of authority seems to be something happening here. Take out the legal part of it, take out everything off of, of it. Otherwise, I feel like we are just a performative group in the town's eyes. And that's not what I want to be a part of and not what I think that this commission is about. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to say, I think we should probably definitely put it on our next agenda, but we, we should we should exercise all of our options, mm -hmm. or at least we should have a discussion about exercising all of our options. Like, I'm, I do like the idea of bumping it up the line. I also feel like, I don't know how anyone else feels about this, I also do feel like that we should probably communicate our frustrations with how this whole thing is playing out, to, like, to the public, like a I'm, I've never been a fan of, of HRC making 50 million public statements, but I think if there's like a, an issue worth talking about, we should not shut up. Yeah, I, I agree. So Ben, um, unfortunately you missed the meeting in July in which um, we had decided and voted on um, making this a part of our meetings monthly until we were satisfied that we either got a response or had some resolution. So we did vote on that um, in July yep. when this first came up, our very first meeting. So this will be on the agenda until we say it's not. Good. So I'm not being like a like an, author an authoritarian jerk here by saying that. I think no, no, not at all. <laughs> we are all on the same page there. <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> all right. Unless anybody else has anything else that they wanted to add into that. Um, I... Ben, unless you see otherwise, I think that allowing public comment is great in this conversation. All right, can we allow that person in? Mm -hmm. Good evening. My name is Pat Ananibako, and I want to thank the commissioners um, for speaking true to the power. I know this is a very difficult conversation and I thank you all for um, the discussion. So I am the liaison of the BIPOC uh, families and you that are involved on um, for the July 5th incident. And I know some of you or all of you know some of the kids involved. I will just ask that we remember to keep um, them in in confidence, confidentiality, because these kids are, you know, their youth, and whatever um, goes into internet will follow them the rest of their lives. Um, I'm not saying anybody mention any names, but just, you know, um, for you guys to bear that in mind. As I listen to all of you, and I've um, been so worried about. HRC structure, I think your group may want to think about um, contacting the town council to um, revise some of the bylaw, because I feel that this commission have talented commissioners that can come up with um, good ideas and advice and actually implement decisions, but it seems to me that the way it's set up, you guys don't have too much decision-making powers. And that needs to be changed. And it has to start from the town council. They need to revise the bylaw. And um, one thing that has not been mentioned during your discussion was um, about asking the kids, what exactly do they want? What will make them whole? What does um, healing look for them? And for, as, as a liaison of, the, of some of the families, what I heard from them is they want 
uh, uh, they want therapy, they want counseling. And as we know, it costs a lot of money. And, and that's why I've been pushing for um, justice compensation fund. I don't want people to confuse it with victim com compensation fund, but um, uh, it was suggested to switch it to justice compensation fund so that these kids can get the help. This will stick with them the rest of their lives. It's lifelong. They're going to need continuous help and even for, for some of their families. And um, we need to think about the personal healing of these kids and their family. And yes, it will cost money and our town needs to pay up. I'm sure if these kids are like middle class families or upper middle class, they will be lawyering up because I know that's what I would do if it happened to my kid or my grandkids. I would have hired lawyer long time ago. So anything without financial compensation isn't going to make these kids whole at all. Our community will not heal either. So we need to do that. For middle-class families, they, they get settled robustly. Why should we have a different standard for um, low-income kids? Thank you. Can I just say to Pat, um, thank you for your comments and thank you for being who you are. You know, she and I go way back. We have children who went to school together and now we have grandchildren around the same age. Um, I, to this day, have no idea who any of the children, I don't know who, I don't know how many. And for me, um, it doesn't matter. It matters to them if I know who they are and I can provide some kind of comfort. I have not been able to do that because I don't know who it is. And if other people are doing that, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, as a commissioner and as someone who, again, this has been my third formal meeting since this incident. Um, if I can provide anything to any of these families, I will definitely be willing to do that. Um, and as far as um, I understand the direct impact to those children, because I've had a situation with both of my sons at one point, one with the UMass PD and one with Amherst PD, where I had to go to bat for both of them. And because of who I am, you know, things changed and things got different because I wasn't going to shut up. But other folks don't have the strength, if I if that's a good word, that I have, that Pat has, that Vera has, um, that some other families have when these kind of situations come up. So I wholeheartedly agree that reaching out and seeing what they would like, um, and if I can be a part of that healing um, or discussion or whatever, um, please call on me, and that's what I need to say. Thank you for putting that out there. And I will say for an overall, I do hope that everyone on this call, everyone in our community feels that the HRC is a place to come to, to be heard. And that goes back to my comments and to Liz, Ms. Haygood's comments about pointing out that this will be on our agenda until we feel satisfied that something has come about from it. And not just the statement by the police that say, we investigated it, we didn't see anything about it, and let's all move on because that's, that's not good enough. Yeah, I, I, yeah there's a lot of things that sound about to get me thinking here. Like the, so so on, on one level, I think like how we, how we do get the public to feel like they can come to us for situations is to be effective in this matter right here. This is kind of a tip of the iceberg moment for us, right, as a, as a commission. And, and the idea of, so A, yes, I, I wanna to speak to the one thing that the, us petitioning um, the town council to explore that bylaw to, to allow us to be more effective. I, I think that's another issue we should probably have. We should, we should probably try to get that on the agenda for our retreat 
like how how that advocacy looks to to the or that advocacy to the town council looks for us. But yeah, yeah, like the idea of making sure that they're whole, made whole after this. That, I mean, that has to be central to everything. And I don't just necessarily mean financially, but I don't not mean financially either. But these are human beings, right? They have a lot of life to live. And like, I, I personally can, can speak to how these situations reverberate throughout your life, right? Like situations I had as a teenager, I mean, I'm 45 years old and they're still fresh. You know, I, I didn't have people to come in and intervene and make it right. And so like, based on that, I, I feel like this is that moment in time that we have to do the right thing and make sure that other people do the right thing, right? That's kind of part of our charge here. Yep. I will be submitting, and I'll do that tonight after this meeting, that email with this extra statement from the family and the quotes from the victims of this situation to the police department. And I will also include in there to add that into the report and we will see what happens at that moment. I, I can't give anything else other than that. As far as from the human rights complaint, Pamela, is there anything that we can do on that end from the human rights, like uh, someone made a complaint to the Human Rights Commission? Can we get that in that, these documents in that way? Hold on. Um, I believe that it's already a part of the um, police department because at least in conversations, I know that the police department was aware that a, a complaint had come in through the HRC because you, a letter was submitted. So my, I mean, you know, I, I haven't seen their record, so I don't know 100%, but my belief is that that's already a part of their ongoing record or okay. of their record. Got it. And as far as uh, the DEI department, Mm -hmm. Do you have any any purview, any I guess yeah. opinion about how to go about it in that way? So the so yeah, so I am somewhat limited in what I can do as well by the collective bargaining agreement. And what um, as I said, what I did do was reach out to the police department, um, had an inquiry about uh, about the incident. Um, I did receive some additional information. I knew that they were uh, conducting an, you know, more investigation by reaching out to the family after the, I can't remember the, after the big town meeting that there was requests to follow up um, and have additional conversations. So I know that that has happened. Um, I received the letter from the family that I provided that to the police department the, you know, this role is being developed in, um, and so there hasn't been, I think to date, a lot of thought about what authority the director would have to investigate or make recommendations or, you know, any of those sorts of things. Um, so that is also a question for for this, for, you know, for this role. I think the, the you know, the, the most important thing that could happen would be, uh, and this is, I'll say, would be the creation of the resident oversight board. Um, and to have that created in a way that um, really, at least for the police department, because that won't apply for other issues that might come before the HRC, but the most important thing that could happen as far as oversight from the for the police department would be the creation of the oversight board. There is an existence currently a state uh, legislation that allows any person um, to report incidents to this newly formed creation called POST um, is the short name for the legislation. Um, and it's like the peace officers safety training. I'm not sure of the name, but basically any allegations of 
um, harassment, um, uh, abuse, discrimination for a wide range of categories uh, uh, is now mandated by state law that that information um, be submitted to post. So I do know that the Amherst Police Department is in compliance with post. The way the statute was written um, in order for the Commonwealth to have all of the police officers uh, in the Commonwealth go through the process, they were sort of doing like a rolling um, startup where like a third of the, of, the, of the departments go through and then another third and another third. So over a three year period, all of the officers um, would have to submit information about it. And um, so that would be an, another possibility um, as a place where, you know, as I talked about earlier, like the, the role of this commission as it's currently risk, um, written is, you know, somewhat restricted, but you would have the ability to send information elsewhere. And that would be uh, one place where for law enforcement, you could send additional information. Okay. Thank you for clarifying mm -hmm. that. And sure. So see. I just have to say it is, I know I came late. I'm actually at another school and a district doing other work. So I'm have to excuse myself for today. Um, I will see you all on the 15th at some point. Are and, you, Liz, are you oh, coming? No, to no, 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 no. Let me let me back up. I will see everybody on the second. All right. Just wanted to make sure. <laughs> oh yeah. It's already in my calendar. All right. 9 a.m. bright and early. Um, right. uh, for those of on, on the commission and those in the audience, please have a blessed and safe week. And um, till we see each other again, everybody stay well. Bye, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. Too. See you. Then I um, had already spoke to the workshop and I will send out a reminder. This is the next line item on the agenda. I'll send out a reminder of the Know Your Rights um, workshop that Sunrise Amherst is doing. And then we have uh, Amherst presentation or preparation support for Migrant family families. Immigrant families. Yes. Immigrant families. Sorry. Yeah. So Jen, I think, placed this on the agenda. She just wanted the HRC to be aware of. Um, you might um, be aware that there was a ho hoax call that came into town hall, um, alleging that there were uh, busloads of um, uh, immigrant families uh, coming from Texas, and in response to that, the town manager. Um, mobilize with Northampton to set up a protocol so that we do, you know, that that call turned out to be a hoax, but Amherst could be a target city because it is a sanctuary city. And um, just wanted to make sure that the commission was aware that there is a protocol in place and an emergency management plan um, that if the situation arises, we do have a plan in place that would be able to um, you know, come together to assist families if they if they arrive in the community. So yeah, I appreciate that. Do you mind? Uh, can you share that with the commission? Like send that out on an email or something? Sure. I don't. You mean the plan itself, or yeah, the just plan the, so, so. Yeah, like the okay. what would the response be? Just okay. Uh, so I I have not seen it, but I can okay. ask about that. <laughs> I, I don't. I, yeah. yeah. Fair we, enough. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and also um, if you could send that to CSSJC as mm -hmm. well, that's a, mix, um, a preview of that committee. That would be great. Yeah. Then we have updates. Um, do you have? So the, yeah, so the first one I think would have been from Liz, but she's no, that's the yeah, Amherst Housing just, Trust Fund. So, um, so that's done. Um, the uh, African Heritage Reparations um, Assembly was at the Black Party, ha, uh, distributed uh, postcards um, so that uh, uh, residents of Amherst who identify as, um, as from African Heritage can now go on to engage Amherst and um, log into their portal and start to self-identify. Um, and they are in the midst of planning 
a number of different community engagement um, events to sort of continue to spread the word about the reparations plan and um, are also have continuing discussions about what criteria would be and what, um, you know, what might be offered in reparation. So that's the ongoing work for them. Um, in the DEI department, we are uh, still working on a um, strategic plan that would be rolled out for our department and for the town. Um, we've gotten a little bit bogged down in sort of the narrative why story, but that is ongoing work. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's been anything else that's been a big push for DEI. I, I would say um, just maybe sub doing some research to support the African Heritage Reparations Assembly about what the content of their page might be. Um, yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on, on other things. The uh, CSSJC will meet next week. Um, I did not attend their last meeting, but I, uh, I believe there are ongoing conversations, uh, um, obviously about the Amherst Police Department and um, also about um, funding and the CBDG grants, um, those types of individuals. So you were there, you <laughs> can probably speak to that. Um, the Resident Oversight Board is a topic for discussion at the next meeting of the CSSJC. So that will be discussed there. I did uh, send out to that group. And I believe, did I send to you as well, Philip, the draft of what the timeline would be to share with HRC? I'm not sure, but um, so those discussions are, know. yeah, those discussions, I, I, those discussions, I think you asked for it. So I'm, I'm hoping yeah, that, I, I sent that, it. That, yes, yes, that does, that does ring a bell. I'm sorry, right. I have to go back in my mind as to. Yeah. So those, those discussions are, are should begin um, next week. Um, uh, Cress, as you guys know, went uh, live on September 6th um, in chats with Earl and Kat and the responders that I've seen. Uh, things are going really well. In their first week, they had over 500 contacts with various individuals. They walked down, um, basically hit all of the businesses in the downtown area. And um, so they're feeling very, very good about their launch. Um, and they've hired and uh, a new implementation case manager, um, implement case manager, implement, I am, I can't remember the title. I'm like, it's tired, it's late and I'm getting uh, tired. So I'm getting tongue tied, but they have hired a new case implementation manager. Um, and I believe that she started either last, I think she must've started last week. So, um, so there's a new hire there, yeah. Yeah, do we, I know you, you're not Earl and you don't know the ins and outs of it, but do we know if they're responding, is responses met well with the community, kind of like how the how all that's going? I'm just interested in that. As right, so, so I, my understanding is that the, re, the responses are going well. So um, Earl and uh, the police department and fire department and dispatch um, together created a list of what would be the first types of calls that they would respond to. And um, that um, protocol seems to be working. I do know that they had uh, one call where they spent five hours with one particular individual um, in one situation. So um, it's, you know, some of the calls have been very uh, time consuming, um, but I haven't heard anything negative about the way in which the rollout has has gone. Um, okay. So I think I think he's very pleased with with how things are going. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for all those reports. I know that was a, a lot of <laughs> of reports to lift yeah. on there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next we have event tabling, and I believe that that was put on the agenda to kind of go back to the discussion of recruitment for. Um, HRC members. I know that at one point, Jen and I had um, just in passing had made a um, 
thought of an idea that maybe the HRC should create kind of like a pamphlet or something when we are tabling, because I had mentioned that it's nothing worse than tabling with an empty table oh. and nothing to really engage people into coming with you. So, um, I right. So, um, it, it, the um, African Heritage Reparations Assembly did create a a, a postcard and. Um, uh, also, like, you know, I'm, I want to say like a token type gift for the tabling event and they tabled at the block party. Um, that was pretty successful. I uh, I don't know how much traffic they've gotten to the engage Amers. So I, I think maybe that might be um, something that could also be discussed at the retreat and, um, um, you know, although I know that they'll want to really hold the time for the community engagement events that they're planning for the discussion of reparations. Mm -hmm. um, those events, if you had a postcard created, would be a place where it could, you know, could be displayed. Like they could, wouldn't try to take away from the time that they have for um, comment and for discussion around those issues. But certainly having a postcard, I think would be appropriate to have um, at those events. So that's, um, um, something to think about yeah yeah i think i think that would be great and hopefully we can collaborate on that in some type of way all commissioners involved so that way we can all agree on what we're handing out <laughs> then the last uh line item on actions and discussion is retreat right so the retreat is coming up as you guys know on october 2nd and i sent or a part of the packet, you received a draft agenda that was basically Jen and I thinking about what um, the retreat might look like. Um, so it's very much a draft. If you, as a, a commission, want to do something totally different, just let us know. We still have time to make changes. Um, the one thing that I would maybe uh, urge you to do is to take some time, if you can, to look at the other information that was sent out, which is the bylaws um, as they are currently written for this uh, commission. Um, and I uh, uh, included in hyperlinks to the uh, affirmative action plan, the equal opportunity, um, equal employment opportunity policy, um, the town's DEA, uh, DEI statement, because one of the things I think would be important for you to think about is aligning the language among those uh, um, documents. And one uh, thing that we'll be doing from the town side for the department is also having conversations about aligning the language, making sure that we're consistent in what we say. So the bylaws are there. And then in a, in a, um, with links to, you know, live links to the laws and stuff that are referenced to it. In addition, I um, included links to human rights commissions from around the commonwealth um the the commissions work very differently in various cities so cambridge has a huge department they have investigators i mean they really sort of act as like an adjudicatory uh um body um i think it's maybe lynn where basically you know they they do like four educational events during the course of the year so there's a wide range of how the human rights commissions operate around the Commonwealth. And um, if you uh, look at those links, you'll, you'll get a, a feel for how different ones um, operate. I, I looked to the town of Arlington to look at their procedures um, for complaint um, procedures because uh, um, the DEI director there has spearheaded a couple of different initiatives in the Commonwealth, and um, and I think they did a good job of resolving the issue about having investigations be um, uh, subject to uh, um, the open meeting law or having commissioners involved in it by using that language and the statutes around the use of mediators. So I again, that's just an example. If you looked at, you know, one of the other cities and towns, and so I really love the way they did this here, all of that um, would be up for discussion. Um, Jen has told me that in the past, um, procedures uh, 
for the town have been on the retreat agenda uh, for many, many years, and they've never <laughs> really gotten uh, gotten completed. So if we could really spend a little time thinking about those proposed procedures, what you might think you'd like differently. I mean, you know, it's just meant as a way to sort of get us started on that conversation so that we can hopefully, um, you know, have some procedures in place, um, you know, by the end of the fiscal year. The other thing that I, uh, I think on the, on the draft agenda, um, it talks about goal setting, like, and I, I thought it would be important for the commission to think about, you know, short-term goals, long-term goals, and also legacy. So, you know, just the idea of like, what would you want this body to, to have accomplished over a longer period of time? So thinking about um, you know, those sorts of things. And so having that information in advance um, hopefully will help um, activate. So we, the time that we do spend together, you know, will be a good start. And we know that the work will be continue, continuing, so. Yeah, I think that brings up a good point. And I think it's relevant to the conversation that we had earlier regarding our bylaws. And so, yeah, I think that that agenda item is a priority for the retreat. Yeah, I, I, I would I would echo that, and also I just want to kind of extend appreciation for the fact that like we're throwing in a long term goal because so the last time we had a retreat, at least an in person retreat, I don't recall talking about long term goals whatsoever. I think we really just no, I don't think I'm I'm trying to be cute about it. We really only discussed what we were going to do for the year, and I I think having like that long term conversation. And then fitting in what we're going to do over the next eight months, that, that makes the most sense, and, and that allows us to be more effective. I think. Yeah, agreed. Victor, do you have anything about retreat? That's all right if you don't. But I'm just I'm giving you. A I mean, excited <laughs> to attend my first retreat, and I. This will be my first retreat as well, Victor. Oh, I came on even better. COVID <laughs> time too. <laughs> The only thing I would add about the uh, retreat is, um, what's for lunch? <laughs> Jen's in, in charge of lunch. I don't think you'll be uh, disappointed. Yeah, yeah, she does. She does well with feeding people. So okay, um, <laughs> that's yeah, that's the important part. You do have to put someone in charge of that that, that, that knows their stuff in that category. Yep. <laughs> Um, upcoming heritage and cultural celebrations. Uh, I spoke to um, Latinx Heritage Month again, just um, echoing that it, that event will be on October 15th. Time pending, place will be at Kendrick Park. And as soon as we get that squared away, I know Jen is looking to create a flyer, but I know that she is out for some time. So I don't know what the timeline of that will be, but I will connect with her on that. Or the family, you know, anything, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I think she'll be out the rest of the week, but, um, you know, I know that uh, that was something that she was working on and she had a conversation with um, someone from the Amherst Public Schools who, who has been actively involved in uh, Latin Heritage Month. So I know that the work is ongoing um, and I um, hopefully she'll be back in on, on Monday. Okay, great. That sounds good. Then uh, our next meeting time, I guess, is the retreat, right? That's, yeah. that's October 3rd or October 2nd, excuse me. Mm -hmm. No one show up October 3rd. We will not be there. It's October 2nd. And 9 a.m. Was that the correct time? Yeah. yeah. All right. And location? Do we? I don't think I have that. Anymore. The uh, location is going to be the Munson um, Library. In the basement again? Um, I think we're, I, I'm not familiar with the building, but I think that what I saw was that we're in an upper floor. Um, is, is there a large meeting room in the? Um, yeah, yeah, and it's, it's uh, so maybe, maybe I'm like weirdly nostalgic New England-ish, but it's like, it's, I, I think it's a beautiful space, but yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great, that sounds better than a basement, but I mean, we'll take a basement if that's what we got. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and then other than that, I, I mean, it says 
any other topic that the chairs did not anticipate for if anybody has anything yeah i i kind of wanted to at least briefly address the um the the, the young man in, in yale that was oh. attacked there what I, what I was i was wondering if anyone had any interest like i'm familiar with the human rights commission in new haven and i'm, I'm wondering if anyone had any thoughts about us reaching out to them at all I think that, that could be good, especially if this individual is an Amherst resident or even previous Amherst resident. I think that connection is already naturally there. So that makes sense to reach out to them. Right. right. And with, with that, I would volunteer to do that strictly because like my sister is involved with them a little bit. So yeah, I I couldn't see why not. I know we can't take a vote on it, but Yep. I think that that's a decision that us as co-chairs can make just to reach out and anything else, any comment or anything like that, then we can just bring to the group at the retreat. Yep, definitely. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try to get on that ASAP then. Awesome. That's great. Thank you for taking that on. Yeah. All righty. Well, then it seems like the next time we will see each other is the retreat. Yes. All right. Thank you everybody for showing up and stop recording. Yeah.